Hello, I'd like to uh, welcome you all to the Movie Palace. This is uh, a special preview event. Um, not only is it the first public event to be held at the Movie Palace, but it's also the per first public appearance of Michael O'Hare in the UK. Uh, my name is Des Watkins, I'm from the Babylon 5 UK fan club. Um, we all know why you're here, so I don't think there's much need for a, a big introduction. I'd just like to introduce Michael O'Hare, the one. <laughs> Before I begin, I'm going to have to ask all of you to remove all of your clothing immediately. <laughs> and squeeze as hard as you can the person sitting next to you. It's an American tradition. <laughs> I just keep getting amazed by this. Can you put that on? <laughs> this is an example of... Uh, of uh, Narn dental problems. <laughs> Further down the line, there's almost total tooth decay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? It's a beautiful mess. <laughs> so, what do you think of working on Babylon 5? <laughs> so, what do you think of Michael O'Hare as an actor? Well, that little son of a bitch. <laughs> what was that again? <laughs> Sober up. Sober up, damn it. Such a car. Sakara, <laughs> Jakara, and ecstasy. <laughs> and these are the Drazi, aren't they? Yeah. 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 Pop, 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 I have small ears, but these are really small. Plenty ears. And this is, of course, is an anteater. <laughs> that's uh, uh, that's the uh, Minbari. I don't know what that's. What is that? Londo. That's Londo. Oh yeah. He's very small. <laughs> Might be an unfortunate tumor of the first pregnancy. <laughs> 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 you, you shouldn't have worn it there. You shouldn't have put it there. You shouldn't have there. <laughs> okay, we're on the head. We're on the head. <laughs> Doctor, I have this slight boil. <laughs> People are beginning to make fun of me. I so anyway, it's good to be here in London. And uh, all the best to all of you. It's a beautiful city. And do most of the people here hail from England? Anyone from any any other country? Because we have from Scottish people. Where are you from? Uh, Germany. Are you from Germany? <laughs> <laughs> no, where are you from? Germany. Germany. We're in Germany. Hanover. Hanover. Hangover. 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 <laughs> I don't know. I'm five. I can just imagine. What are you doing? What are you doing? I can't see it much. I watched uh, a wonderful uh, special on, in, on the uh, royal family that played on PBS a couple of weeks ago. I gather, I gather it's a few years old, but I only just came across it. And it's wonderful about the family. And there was, there, they introduce, uh, they uh, interview one fellow who I think is a Cockney guy. Perhaps you're familiar with the story. He just wanted to talk to the queen. Oh, and he climbed through the window and went <laughs> and he, 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 he walked around a bit and he found himself in her bedroom. <laughs> and I think with a lady, you should send a note first. <laughs> just a bit.
imagine the poor queen. She's been, she's been through so much. She really is a, a magnificent example of the uh, English sense of duty and responsibility. I, I know that sounds kind of saccharine, but she really is a, an admirable woman. She's dealt with an awful lot. And it, it had her in Africa uh, with Prince Philip uh, when she discovered that her father had died and then they had to go back. And, Suddenly, all she was 25, wasn't she? Yeah. Imagine that. Imagine that responsibility being put on your shoulders. At least she has good outfits. I have to dress like a bellhop. And, <laughs> <laughs> and that coach. Good God. That's a nice piece of. <laughs> Just fixing the wheel. <laughs> Look like you were taking it off. But uh, I admire. Which may sound uh, corny or old-fashioned, but I really do. Mm -hmm. She really is quite a lady. Does your country proud? Did, uh, Des, did Des pop her an invite or not? <laughs> yes. yeah, she should have been. Well, she rings me up in the middle of the night asking for advice. And I say, for God's sake, I'm not really in charge of a space station. It's, it's pretend. Is that what you're the that? one, Michael. Yeah, you're the one. <laughs> no, you're the one, really. <laughs> I'm just the pretend one. <laughs> one of the things I loved about uh, working on Babylon 5 is I got a chance to work opposite all these great actors, many of them English. And I love the American actors. And if anybody, you probably didn't see the Cosby Mysteries, but I did more of an American actor kind of. Did you see that? We saw like 30 seconds oh, of yeah, it on know. the convention on the other side. Yeah, so I call it the Commander Gone Bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just didn't mention Gangster anything. with a limo. Why don't you say anything about acting alongside Edward Woodward as an American actor? Uh, is that true? Is that I'm sorry? True? Did you do a part in The Equalizer? Or I did a small part? part with them once. You yeah. didn't mention that as an acting uh, kind of accolade. Was, what's what Edward Woodward like? What do you mean I didn't mention as an actor? <laughs> well, he's also a, also a brilliant actor. He is? Oh, yeah, Edward Woodward? Yeah. Did you ever see Breaker Moret? Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, he's, he's an extraordinarily good actor. We're looking for his equalizer, definitely. Oh, sure. <laughs> and with Tom Callan? Yeah. That's, that's what always happens in episodic television. When you think about it, my dialogue coach and I worked out, I mentioned this earlier today, that I had in, a fa had in fact shot the equivalent of ten and a half feature length films between the end of July and the end of the third week of March. Ten and a half feature films. So, that when there's that much footage of you going out, people are bound to get to know of you more in that context than they will your other feature film work or mm -hmm. stage work because the, the message, the, the, the uh, images reach so many more people. And unless if you're at the level of someone like uh, uh, Stallone or uh, uh, Gibson or Costner, do you know what I mean, where you get in the feature film context that kind of exposure. There's no way anyone's going to be aware of your work as much. So the joke becomes Edward Woodward is known for Equalizer but the real, by a great many people, but the reality, he's done an incredible amount of mm -hmm. superb feature So films. what would you like Michael Ahead to be recognized for? Hmm? What would you like Michael Ahead to be recognized for? Having won the, the most extraordinary trust fund ever imagined. <laughs> Yeah. Retired to the countryside. <laughs> we <laughs> well, well, I don't know. You know, I hope it go. I hope it all goes well. But uh, but I do think Patrick Stewart raised the genre. Mm -hmm. I really what, think he did. What part would you most like to play if you had a pick? Pick of any part. Well, fiction, you know, film, book. Uh, King Lear. Oh, wow. But I'm too young for it. I'm like, <laughs> no, seriously, I, you, you have to understand that inside yourself, what that means. What it means to go through those changes of life. And although they say John Gielgud's advice to one of the other great ones, I forget who it was, who, uh, was it Michael Horton that did Lear recently? Yeah. It was, and he was supposed to be quite wonderful in it. Or, and I think this was Gielgud's advice to Horton, get a light Cordelia. <laughs> you have to carry her much more than you think. <laughs> These guys all act like that's their biggest concern. The reality is they're very disciplined and good actor. But um, I tell you what, I'd love to do a feature film of uh, a remake of um, Boys Town that Spencer Tracy did. I'd like that a lot. And Mickey Rooney says he's not heavy father, he's my brother. And I'll get all choked up if I talk about that. <laughs> Why is it like acting with special effects? Like you're acting towards something that maybe isn't there. 
I didn't, I, I, because of my experience with certain actors in my life, it was, I was used to that already. Right? <laughs> 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 yes, of course, absolutely, names and addresses to be sure. No, I'm sure some feel that way about me. Uh, I uh, didn't find it all that uh, difficult or unusual. I mean, very often, uh, we shoot that uh, Babylon 5 in, in seven days. We have to get 42 cut minutes out of that. So we move incredibly quickly. I, can't, I don't know how many setups there are in a day, but there are a great many. And my dialogue coach and I figured out that I, in effect, did 10 and a half, uh, the equivalent of 10 and a half feature films between the end of July and the uh, middle of March with two 10 day breaks. So it's just like, <laughs> I used to call myself the Babylon 5 Clydesdale. Do you know what that the Clydesdale is the enormous horse that pulls the Budweiser wagon, you know. So <clears throat> but uh, in the in the uh, confines of moving very quickly, if for instance, uh, let's say there is a you know the console that I would be on looking at things? Okay. The camera is put <clears throat> uh, they take out the window of the uh, the, the, the front of the station, and the camera is there, right? But in reality, the console's at a certain height. They can't keep, you know, it would cost a fortune to put on a hydraulics to raise it and lower it for the different heights and body sizes of each actor. So you have to adjust, and the camera's trying to get a good enough angle to catch your eyes. And I'm, I have rather, a rather simian brow, and... Uh, <laughs> So monkey boy, you know, <laughs> you have to... I, I'd like to brag my eyebrows can be used as a table brush after dinner. What? Does this mean you have to come in on your knees to get the part? I think you have to come in on your knees to get the part. Oh. And then, <laughs> occasionally they ask you to be on your knees, you know, just so you don't forget the position. But, uh, <laughs> but I lean on the uh, console quite often, right? Now, it would, it would be too expensive and too time consuming to do all the changes you would have to do at the console in order to make where I'm, if I'm looking at the center of the console, here is the top of it, all right, and there is the camera over there. Now, if I'm looking at the center where the actual graphics are that you would be seeing in, a, in, a, in an intercut, uh, my eyes would be hidden from the camera, right? So what I would do very often is play to a red taped X, and I would react to that. So there's a lot of the... Uh, and that way they don't have to move the camera and move the console and they can catch uh, into these deep sockets. So I, I'm, I'm not unaccustomed. So when you come to a large screen, if you know what I mean, that's a projection screen or something like that, it's not really actually new to me. It just seems to be. In fact, I do a pretty good one of them. <laughs> you can do it like that. It's not the hard stuff. After the pilot, during the pilot, there was one scene where I walked away from uh, an emphatic discussion with Jakar, and I said to myself, because uh, I was getting used to all of this, you know, and I said to myself, I've just had a serious conversation with a lizard, I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I accepted it completely. So I haven't had that much, I have, did, never once laughed when I looked at Londo's hair, or, I mean, how do you sit, can you imagine in real life sitting opposite someone with hair like that, and they're saying, and another thing that I think. <laughs> Really? <laughs> Who does your hair? <laughs> you ever thought of just patting it down just a bit? <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm amazed the degree to which I uh, uh, found it easy to acclimate to it. Maybe because I've done a certain amount of classical theater and I'm not unaccustomed to people in robes with unusual outfits coming on and saying things. As uh, I, I like to quote uh, Mira Furland who says about acting in science fiction, you come, you say, you leave. <laughs> because there isn't a lot of, it's not like, uh, it's not like uh, colloquial naturalism. It has a little bit of a classical tint to it. You have to be able to come on and stand like this quite a bit. And uh, you don't have the advantages of being able to sit, you know, like this or relax or this kind of thing because the uniform gets wrinkled or something like that. Although I worked for, uh, uh, as much uh, uh, looseness in it as I possibly could. But it's the genre, I accept it, it's fantasy, yeah.
So how do you react to the critical, uh, whether it's a good, good or yes, whether it's a yes or a no by the critics, how do you react to it? Because it would never have happened before in such a larger scale with Battle of the Five. If you were in uh, the theatre, you wouldn't have so much critical uh, analytical studies upon you. If someone oh, says, right. you, well, you have a bad point, they say, well, well, I've read you wouldn't. I don't think that's true. Oh, right. Well, okay? Look, now, well, look, at, the beginning of, react? at the beginning of the series, okay, we we're looking for ways to develop the character. All right. And while you work on the show, you, the, my initial uh, job was to advance plot and introduce characters. So it didn't afford me as much opportunity to show other sides. Yeah. Also, I was working uh, very specifically <coughs> with the character to deal uh, very subtly with his interior life. So that doesn't mean I'm doing a lot of this all the time. You know what I mean? Plus, I'm standing in a military way. So as the audience, as the viewers, uh, when they first, if, if most of you go to see a play, Okay. If you found yourself with the experience of the first 20 minutes or so, you don't know really if you buy this, and you're a bit uncomfortable, and if the play is successful, you suddenly find yourself little by little being drawn into the world, and before you know it, it's, the evening seems to have gone so quickly. All right. That's the same thing in the beginning of a television series. So what at the first is thought as wooden is later on seen as he's doing his a military uh, stoic thing. Well, how did you react to that? If you, if you oh, got the dailies and that, it didn't bother you? Damn, couldn't care less. <laughs> truly, <laughs> truly. So, uh, if, because you believe the good stuff, you know, I've also read a lot of good stuff. So if you believe the bad stuff, you have to believe the good stuff, and everybody has an opinion all the time, you know, so. But, uh, mm. it's, it, further down the line, suddenly the whole thing changes. People got to get the idea of what I was doing, and then, particularly in this genre, people make copies of the tapes and study them, mm -hmm. and they go back and they say, oh, I see what you were doing, all oh, the subtleties, da 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 uh, Also, we work out more about how you're going to film it. You know, that affects how you appear as well. Uh, so, it's gone from, uh, it's, it's, it's grown to be a, a, a fairly popular character, I, I gather, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. So, they got into it, you know. And then suddenly it goes, changes from wooden to that he has gravitas. <laughs> <laughs> and then poor Bruce has to deal with people going, no gravitas, smiles too much, next! <laughs> it's insane. You know what I mean? So you, if you watch Bruce's performances, he goes from at first smiling, and then he brings the smile, informs it, settles it down. Then you begin to, to get into that character. But at the beginning, there's always that jump start. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Where people are going, no, no, it's not, you know. They've been giving Bill Shatner a hard time, and suddenly they go, it's not Bill Shatner. Do you know what I mean? Or it's not Patrick Stewart. Do you remember uh, Star Trek The Next Generation in the first yeah. season? Yeah. yeah. You know. There was a lot of that stuff, too. Mm -hmm. Things, that, and they, and it's also the actors. We do get better at what we do. It's like any job, the team at the beginning has got some potential and it looks hopeful and hopefully they uh, work, get enough time and enough opportunity to work together and work together and they get to be quite good if they've got ability. So it's the same in every show. Hill Street Blues at the end of the first season was lucky to be picked up and uh, people thought didn't think it was so good and the critics were very hard on it at the beginning and all of that and suddenly it turns around and, oh my god it's brilliant it'll never be another Hill Street Blues. You know what I mean? And it's, it really has to do, I think, with human nature and adjustment to new ideas or new ways of doing things. You know, people have gone from being shocked that I'm gone and thinking there's something wrong to being uh, uh, excited about the mystery of the situation and curious to see what's going to happen next. You know? Has she, has she come by to get the part? Hmm? There's a lot of other people going up to the park, Sinclair or... Well, my father is fabulously wealthy. All he has to do is make a phone call. And I just said, Daddy, Daddy, I want to act. Can you call someone? What would you like to be? Oh, I don't know, someone in outer space or a cowboy. Something flashy and big with guns that don't work. <laughs> no, it was like many other auditions I've been on. I walked in, uh, I'd, I'd had the, the side, which is just a piece of the script, the scenes, a day earlier, 
And a lot of times they don't give you much time in television. It's one thing I really have a problem. And they don't do it in features either. They just throw these things at you and you got to try to come up with something at the last minute. But that's like everybody has problems in their job. You come in, they put you on tape, they have a video camera like this. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they tape it. And it's fairly efficient for them because then they mail the tape to uh, California. Because I'm in New York. And they looked at it there and brought me out to California and had me, uh, uh, which is sort of like you've made one cut and that's the next step. Mm -hmm. Then they put me on tape with some of the members of the original pilot cast. And then a week or so later, I heard that I had the part. I mean, I know it sounds very matter of fact. Most of the time you go on these auditions, you don't get it. You need, it needs to dovetail on a variety of levels. Then if you reach uh, a higher level of success, then they come to you and they ask you, and that's different. You have a question? Uh, you mentioned Patrick Stewart doing the theatre. I was wondering whether you had an interest in any theatre. Oh. oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll be auditioning for plays. We'll see what happens. I've Would been on Broadway uh, four times. And... Would you like to do Shakespeare? Oh, sure. I've done Shakespeare. You have? Yeah, I did uh, uh, one of the parts. I'll tell you a funny story. <clears throat> we did a production. I won't mention the actor. and uh, He's a wonderful actor. But on this particular, he, he played Richard III, but he came up with the idea that evil is actually stupid. Now, I don't happen to agree with that. I think that evil can be perpetrated by very intelligent people. Mm -hmm. And part of Richard III's appeal is that he's very bright, and it's mm -hmm. sort of uh, compelling, the cleverness with which he perpetrates his evil, and the kind of charm in which he's duplicitous. Uh, how one can smile and smile, yet be a villain. Uh, but his interpretation was that evil was stupid. And I can remember, the, I can remember the young lady who played uh, Lady Anne, who for her was a big break to get in this production and work with this big star. But by the time we got to Washington, D.C., she was so worn out by the battering we took by the critics and all of that that she no longer held this guy in awe. And she said to him in fascination, but you, she said to him in frustration, she said to him, I came, I have just overheard it in the hall. She said, but you're playing him like baby Huey. <laughs> <laughs> she finally didn't care anymore. It was a big shot. <laughs> and he said, exactly. And went on. <laughs> and I went, oh, I've got to see this. So I went over to the wings to do it. And because she had put it in his mind that night, you know, and we had done some 80 performances of the play already, he began to throw a little of baby Huey into it. <laughs> and I had played, I played uh, Richmond in it. You know, in, in Richard III, Richmond is the good king who comes out, or good, good general comes out at the end and gets rid of the bad guy. And Shakespeare does away with some of his bad guys that way. <clears throat> and the way we played it is I played it as sort of a, <clears throat> there was a phenomena of healing kings that uh, uh, had, were considered to have mystic powers of some sort. And we did it in uh, uh, Napoleon era clothing. And so I was dressed like Wellington. And uh, it, the uh, lights came up, because Richmond's really a very awful. Let's, let's face it, it's a theatrical device. You've got to get rid of this crazed hunchback before he causes any more problems. But it, so the lights came on at me at the end, where I'm just kneeling, you know, in preparation of this. And by this time, the audience was so tired with the production of the play that was too long that wasn't paced right, and that had an idea that the lead should play evil as stupidity, which made it, it just didn't work. So I could hear a visible groan when they, when the lights came up, not a visible groan, an audible groan, when the lights came up, because they realized, they realized, this thing isn't over yet. There's <laughs> another character, it can't be. And my brother, my brother Mark said to me, Boy, Mike, you know, who's not like normally a theater goer, he said he was in the audience with his wife at that time. And he said to me, uh, Boy, Mike, me and the people sitting around me were sure glad when you killed that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I knew they could all, oh, he's dead. That's got to be it, right? <laughs> it's over now. That's enough culture. Thank you. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm just rambling. Open 
Yes. I did uh, a couple of times I've done uh, a little workshop which is really just designed to introduce people to the beginning of a certain technique I learned from uh, a great acting teacher called Sandy Meisner who was part of the group theater. Have you ever heard of the group theater? You know how the Americans in the 50s uh, got the reputation as being the ones who were the sort of scratch and sniff but they're, they're very realistic and the British were considered to be a bit arch and you know I'm terribly hurt. I feel so bad. <laughs> you know, and, and the Americans are going, oh, for God's sake, come on, blow your nose, you know, be like a regular guy. Da -da 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 -da. And uh, Anthony Hopkins, in an interview I saw once, talked about going to the library and stealing these books, you know, to, he was poor, you know, to, to literally learn this style. But the British have learned it and have included their own magnificent classical training so that they're both create the illusion of realism and are theatrically effective, where sometimes the Americans have to be careful that they've created the illusion of realism, but it's just uh, can be boring to watch. So I do give this little workshop where you do a little repeat exercise. And the group theater was part of that. It was more, it was from social realism in the 30s, and the idea was the working class man and woman, which is really that, where that kind of behavior came from. And. Uh, he was a roommate of Clifford Odets. Have you ever heard of Clifford Odets? Mm -hmm. So he's a great maestro, Sandy Meisner. He's, he's taught a lot of the great actors. So I teach a little bit of that, but it's just more like a fun thing for somebody to do for, uh, for an hour, if they like, when I come to a convention. I've done it a couple of times. But you were getting sleepy. Breathing <laughs> 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 in. <laughs> Michael O'Hare, the classic commander and soporific. <laughs> yes, please. Was acting your first choice of career? Uh, actually, gardening was. <laughs> uh, but I kept making a mess of everything. Uh, it was, it was. I had mixed feelings about it at this stage in my life at times. I know. Uh, uh, many times feel the need or the, the desperate desire to slap on makeup and stand up in front of strangers and say other people's lines and pretend I'm someone else. Uh, if the material is wonderful, you get a chance to tackle Shakespeare, which I have a few times, uh, certainly not on a level with Patrick Stewart, uh, but a few times. And Chekhov, for instance. I used to have a, a saying, uh, there have been a couple of plays I've done where I would, when I was done with the scene, I would walk off stage and I, I, the stage manager would get used to it as a joke. I would mumble, not as good as Chekhov. Because, <laughs> you know, those people are so good that they humble you and you're, you do everything you can to try somehow to approach doing, a, uh, doing your job, working in service to, to their uh, genius. Not all. Writing is the same, though. So. I wouldn't be averse to uh, directing. I have, I'm, I have more of a director-producer's personality, I think, than an actor's personality. Which these are dangerous generalizations, but have you I do. Uh, no, I haven't. I've coached acting a little bit, but I haven't done it. I may. Do you think that Gerald let you direct in the show all the time? No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you know. But John Flynn, our director of photography, who is also a very good film director, the guy nominated for an Emmy, he's, he's directed a couple of episodes. And should, I hope, be allowed, in my opinion, he should be allowed to direct a lot more. I call him the real commander. I, on the floor of a tele, episodic television show, that floor is nicknamed the pit, and you work like an animal. And they used to joke that the, the commander has no life. You know that was the deal. And you're, I'm great. Was grateful for the work, and it was a good time. But the guy who really runs the pit is the director of photography, or the woman, if, it, if it's a woman who's the DP. And he was magnificent. I feel a great loyalty to him. So he's directed a few. I hope to have him direct more. 
But we haven't had a situation like they have on Star Trek where some of the actors later on uh, directed episodes. That hasn't been the case with, with us. I think you have to be around for a while before you can even bring that up. Do you know? And beware when you hear of a director directing an episode, uh, check out who their cinematographer is. Or in features, they call it cinematographer. In TV, they call it director of photography. Check out who the director of photography is. Because believe me, that's the person who's really, you know, setting up a lot of the shots, which is tough to do. The real power behind the camera. The real power behind the camera, right, right. The real commander, as you so like to call it. <laughs> I was only in charge of people during the time that the camera was actually turned on. And you had to pay them to pretend to follow my orders. <laughs> So it's, it's, not quite, it's not quite the same thing. Boy, it's getting hot up here. Are the costumes as uh, uncomfortable as they sometimes look? Y yes, they are. <laughs> but then I count myself lucky. Look at the outfits that some of the other people have to wear. Uh, I was, uh, I used to joke that you just have to throw me in a chair and slap. I was done in, you know, 15 minutes, my makeup. Some of those people were in there for two or three hours, and very hot. When we shot the pilot, it was particularly hot, particularly hot, breathtakingly so. But uh, yeah, it was hot. I, I, for some reason, I have the capacity, I don't know why, to be in a very hot situation and uh, not perspire that much. I know it's odd, I know it's odd. But it wouldn't be till the end of the day that they needed to pat me down a lot. Even now, there isn't. It's very hot in here, and there's very little, I don't know why, probably some physiological malfunction. <laughs> <laughs> what I've saved on powder, I'll, uh, I'll drop dead at 52 or something. <laughs> well, at least we didn't have to powder him. He looks good. <laughs> what, were you saying? what did you say? I said maybe it's the Minbari effect. <laughs> it's the Minbari effect. It's because I have a Minbari soul. <laughs> the new Minbari soul. <laughs> Last longer, waterproof, <laughs> and very uplifting. You said earlier that acting was your first choice of career. Yes. Uh, if you were, were not going to be an actor or you were going to change direction, what would you like to do? Trust it's, fund, baby. Or, or <laughs> I would choose trust fund, baby. I would choose. I know they say that their lives are heartbreakingly boring and they have very little direction in their life, but they're rich. <laughs> I think that it, you can always, you can find a career later on, I say. But uh, writing and directing, I'd be interested in. And uh, even producing, I think. Uh, Do you like to work in the science fiction genre of that? Sort of? That genre or, or any genre. I don't want to remain exclusive to science fiction, nothing against it, but I, I want to. Uh, maintain enough elasticity in my life so that I can be in a variety of genres and not be relegated to one. That's uh, one of the things that's good about the way my work has gone with Babylon 5. I don't feel that I'm going to forever be labeled as a fellow in an unusual outfit in charge of a large piece of equipment that travels through space, do you know? And that is the downside of uh, uh, being identified with a show for a long period of time. And uh, I'm, I mean, I, I hope to come back and play with much longer hair. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You know, I'm serious. Do another character. No, but do another character if he's a gorilla. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have brought that up. I'm, I mean, G U E, not G O R. <laughs> Very funny. Sort of just see me going, you know. <laughs> Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> bananas, quick, bananas. <laughs> Are you going to go to Chrysalis as well? <laughs> uh, I, I don't. I don't think so. Where I become more gorilla-like, you mean? <laughs> the real truth comes out. Look, at, it's already beginning. I'm working on the. I'm very much like Al Pacino. I'm working on the character for months before I go on. But I don't think I'll be in a chrysalis. I think it was particular to her physiological changes. Did you 
she got paid while she was in there. Did she what? <laughs> Did she get paid while she was in there? No, that was one of the things they love about it. That's what those damn Hollywood people do to you. They put you in a chrysalis and they don't pay you or give you a, a glass of water or anything. She actually was in the chrysalis for one shot. When I come in and reacting to the chrysalis, she's not in it. I don't believe she was in it. <laughs> <laughs> method, method, the method act. But, uh, no, by guerrilla fighter, I mean that now I've gone to fight the shadow people and to, to uh, sort of be the head of the rangers. And uh, that would give me more room. It's a little bit like someone in standard military uniform who now goes off to the jungles to uh, be involved in combat about against, against a greater evil. So that would afford me an opportunity to change my appearance somewhat. And it's my sincere hope that I won't be in that outfit anymore. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it, look, I don't mean to make fun of the outfits. They're great. I'm, I'm very grateful to have had the job. I'm, uh, How are you supposed to be getting new outfits? Are they to be new oh, I suppose so, but let's face it. Honey, <laughs> an outer space outfit is an outer space outfit. You know what I mean? I mean, they're all a certain, huh? They're all, you know. Hello. <laughs> it's pretend, to be sure. I mean, all the Star Trek people in the spandex all the time. <laughs> During the first season, of course, Sinclair was coming to terms with this, the hole in his mind is quite a tortured character. How do you think it's going to change him now he knows what's in the hole in some Inbari soul? I think that, I think that he'll be much more, uh, uh, at peace really, and far more spiritual in quality. I think that's the point of, just as he comes to the chrysalis, I think it's interesting that he is seen, uh, that the, the metaphor for transformation includes not uh, includes Delenn and Sinclair, because it's Sinclair who's put at the chrysalis to discover Delenn, and as he discovers Delenn in transformation, in a period uh, in a period of transmogrification, trans how do you say transmogrify, yeah. of being transmogrified? I can't do the transmogrification. Transmogrification. Yeah. As you see her, as he sees her in that state. The, for me, the metaphor of the picture in the two shot, where you see him seeing her, is that he is about to go through that as well. Because he hasn't been aware of the fact that he has a Minbari soul. He doesn't know that. Does, does he present the fact that he was tricked into the marriage from father to bridge? I don't think he knows what the situation is. I think he just had a cherry tomato. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It's hard to put one of those in your mouth and then not overact, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a mixed one, it was too big. <laughs> oh, a little seed here. <laughs> Honey, I have a little. <laughs> and here's it. Isn't it just, just, let me be sexist for a minute, just like a woman. Tomato for you. <laughs> <laughs> I used to joke that I couldn't believe I was married in the state of California where property is split 50-50 as there's a breakup. <laughs> but she gets, she gets half of the station. Right off the bat, things don't work out. <laughs> uh, but so just as we all, I think as we grow, if we're lucky, we evolve and very often this is happening more in psychotherapy, that the uh, psychotherapists are talking about uh, the spiritual quality of, of, of humankind. So we're more and more coming back to that, even though there was a period of rebellion against what was considered decadent in the traditional organized religions. I think the baby was thrown out with the bathwater. And not to be some uh, uh, Bible-thumping raised fundamentalist about it, but I think that we all have a soul. That's my private perspective. And that it's, uh, our, our life involves uh, a journey towards uh, revealing that soul more to ourselves and to others. So Sinclair becoming aware of the fact that he has a Minbari soul, I don't know how to play that. So what I will play is a human being who becomes more aware of their soul 
and its connection to what I call God and what others might use a variety of names to describe, whether God is a he or a she or an it or a higher power. So I think that he will be beyond the tortured stage about things. Although I imagine he's going to be a bit concerned about what it's like to fight uh, shadow men who dwarf the uh, internecine battles that have been taking place on Babylon 5 and make them look like a walk in the park. I mean, I, and I love the graphics on that. How about it? Aren't they great? Because the shadow men, they really have these, uh, it's like a organic, the ship seems to breathe. Yeah. I, I like to use the comparison that all the battles that have taken on, that have gone on between the, the Narn and the Centauri and all of these between uh, the Earth Alliance and, uh, and the Minbari, all of this are like ants having fights on an anthill. And suddenly the shadow men come, and it's like an enormous dark hand that casts, you know, uh, a frightening shadow over the hill. And suddenly the ants uh, had better band together. Although one, Lando, has struck a, a bargain with the dark side. And uh, my guess is, as yet another fan of Babylon 5, he's going to get his knickers snapped for that. <laughs> so, yes? Have you been reading the comics? I haven't read every issue, but I've read some of them. And I get a kick out of them. Uh, I can't believe that... And they grow increasingly... Uh, um, more like me in, in, in the drawings. Yeah, yeah. The first one was a little bit like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Why, how complimentary, thank you so much. <laughs> it's horse face, what do you know? <laughs> I'm sorry? <laughs> well, my mother wouldn't let us read comic books. She thought it was the end of civilization. You know? she said, Here comes the bread and circuses, was what she'd say. And she's not half wrong about it. I think it's time for us to pull our horns in a little bit in Western society before we all go right out the window. But uh, I find them, I get a kick, I, I get a kick out of the fact that I'm a a grown man and, and a young man who I raise is my son, who isn't mine biologically, but who we care very much about each other. Uh, I will one day get a kick out of the fact that his father was this was actually the the lead character in a comic book. <laughs> <laughs> I see no money from it. I don't. I see no money from it. How can you live up to that? How can I live up to that? Well, I'm a superhero in a comic book. Do you believe me? <laughs> and I don't even have to wear a cape. I guess I shouldn't. Shouldn't complain about. Uh... We're just going to be winding things up in a few minutes. Is there any final questions? Yes, please. What happened to your wife to be, Catherine Sakai? Catherine Sakai? Yeah, she just disappeared. She just disappeared. Now I don't know in the plot if that what what's going to happen with that. No. I really don't know. Joe has said that she you basically postponed it before you went away. Did she say that? No, Joe said that. That is the storyline. Oh, the storyline. You postponed it. I postponed it. Yeah, you postponed it. And then I went away. And then you forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, the story, as I understand it, is Sinclair got drunk and showed up wearing bunny ears <laughs> and gum boots at the wedding, and she called it off. <laughs> Your sense of humor has gone far enough, Jeff. Awesome. Show some decorum. What? Well, that's what you forgot. Yeah. Oh, really? That's what you forgot? You've forgotten something. The line, Kosh comes in. I don't know about that. I think what Kosh says, now see, as an actor, believe me, many of these mysteries that are mysteries to you are mysteries to me as well. And when I come across lines, I try to make it real for myself. I suspect, now for me, just as another fan, I think Kosh, when, she said, when he says there's something you forgot, is talking about my Minbari soul. Which leads me to Delenn. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which leads me to a metaphor that's put right in front of me of uh, transfiguration that I may or may not understand. 
uh, as we grow, I believe part of our journey in life is to be able to see the signs when they're given to us because they're everywhere. So I suspect I did uh, forget in a way or postpone it. Imagine the president's dead and not just shot, you know, I mean, all these other people. Think of all the other people who died with him. Uh, Garibaldi appears to be on his deathbed at that time. <coughs> Delenn has suddenly disappeared and is in some strange cocoon uh, uh, that doesn't tell me if she's alive or dead or what's going to come of it. Crisis comes from everywhere, and I say in that episode, uh, things aren't the same anymore. So it's a pig, uh, I think it's a time of uh, destruction and rejuvenation. So, but that's just my, you know, as we all, that's one of the beauties of the writing of the show. You know, you, everybody can put their mark on it, so to speak. Hopefully there'll be more, yeah. Michael, I understand you've written some stories. Yes, but that's a, something I never talk about. <laughs> no, it really is. What kind of stories? Are they based, what kind of genre are they based on? Well, <clears throat> it's about um, uh, a woman and a collection of Dobermans that she writes. <laughs> <laughs> There's both humor and danger in it. <laughs> Tina of eroticism. No. <laughs> There's one called Hey Fido. <laughs> and there's Rover, you're my boy. <laughs> but uh, no, I, they're, they're more uh, uh, what I think of as humorous stories. They're not in the keeping with. I mean, there are a lot of parts to me that I'm not able to use playing Sinclair. I hope I'll be able to show more colors uh, when I do the other, uh, when I do the two-parter. But the fact of the matter is, I'm fighting shadow men now. Before, I was trying to protect the station from being destroyed. So it's not the kind of part where I'm going to be going, <laughs> you know, it just is. You know, Garibaldi can horse around, you know what I mean? But uh, well, my responsibilities are such that there isn't a lot of room. How long does a two-part take? How long would that take? You've got no idea, obviously. It would take 14 it. days to shoot, I would think. And you get given the full script for the... Two days when you're I would guess, yeah, I would guess, I would hope so. Do you get time to prepare any, or? I would want that, yeah. Do you get that? Well, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> Not this particular thing, yeah. Right. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'd be very disappointed if I didn't get some advanced time to truly study the script. You don't get that kind of time when you're shooting an episodic show every week. I would uh, be shooting one script and learning the next one, and uh, crash and sleep late Saturday morning, and then maybe go out Saturday night, but it was, believe me, it wasn't, it's not a glamorous line of work, anybody who thinks it is. And then work on learning lines and preparing for the next week. Uh, but that's just the nature of the job. I was grateful for the job, but uh, it's, uh, it's a hard work when you do it. Yes? Yes, ma'am? I don't know your name. So. <laughs> you! There! <laughs> Expectations of being so popular, but did you expect to have to do guest appearances as you're doing now, or is that a pleasant surprise? It's a pleasant surprise. I had was no it a idea. Shock, though, to begin with? Uh, not a shock, but just a pleasant surprise. I mean, what amazes me is the amount of mail I get, which I just cannot possibly answer. I mean, in the old days in Hollywood, they had a, uh, 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 yeah, you know, they had a studio system where there was a whole office full of people in charge of answering the mail. But I don't have those sort of facilities, so. Every now and then I try to pick one or two out and give an answer back, but it would be impossible and prohibitive. I mean, keep writing. Has it snowballed? Has it got larger and larger since you haven't been a Well, yes, it has. Suddenly now I'm very popular in Britain. Well, the show itself is. Yeah, it right, exactly. Popular? Yeah, so I benefit from that. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm saying you, you, you write, and obviously you've got interest in literature as well, and reading, and yeah. that sort of thing, and uh, that was reflected in Sinclair with these listening to tennis and things. Right. Is that something you admire, or was that for me by JMS, that part of the character? Uh, that was something uh, that's a quality of mine. I don't know if Joe took it and then uh, had me uh, uh, be someone who was at a literary event and listened uh, to tennis. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how that came. That would be the horse or the cart which came first. That I don't know. I do know that they asked me how I wanted my uh, quarters decorated. And I asked that there be some African art in it. 
and I asked that there be some books. Now, books at that period of time might be actually almost antique, dear little things, do you know what I mean, that you keep. But I was aware of the power of the screen, and I wanted the children who watched it, and the adults, to um, <clears throat> see that he was interested in the culture of Africa, and to see books. Just my little subliminal <laughs> gift on two things I would like to see improve in the United States, the black-white relationships and, uh, and the uh, plummeting literacy. So and I think those have effect. I, and I, and so I think what's shown on television does condition and affect the audience. Do you have a favorite piece of writing or poem? Uh, I mean, something special. In my craft or selling art, exercised in the still of night, when only the moon is raging, and all the lovers lie abed, with only their griefs in their arms, I labor by singing light, not for bread or charms, or what is it? Or something of the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart, not for the proud man. Apart from the raging moon, I write these spindrift pages, nor for the towering dead with their nightingales and psalms, but for the lovers, who, uh, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who heed, who give no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or sell an art. That's by uh, Dylan Thomas in my craft or sell an art. Set it up loud. <laughs> it goes like this In my craft, <laughs> sullen art, exercise in the still of night, when only the moon is raging. We can see you see Claire coming out there. <laughs> <laughs> We're just drawing to a close, shall we? So just a few other right. questions. Are you making an interest in one five? Oh, you mean if I watch it on my own? Yeah. Yes. And I'm not much of a television. Not at all. Do you recognize Paul when you see it? Yeah, it's story. <laughs> this is a plot-driven show, I think, where character becomes, now there's been enough time for character to be examined somewhat. But it's, uh, it's story-driven. It's not uh, uh, personality-driven, you know which is good. Star? It's the writer's show. Were you aware at the start that there was going to be a five-year story? Oh, yeah. 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 And that Joe said he would go no further. One of the most, not just because it's your line of work, but one of the first things that occurred to me when I watched a completely cut together episode was to go over and kiss the hem of Ron Thornton's gown because, you know, you, know, you look pretty ridiculous in the dailies, you know, put that ray gun down, you big squiggly thing, get out of there. I'm not afraid of you. You know, it's very easy for the hero, you see, you know, some big hero walking down a western street, you know, bullets flying around it, you know what I mean? But in reality, and he seems so cool, we realize, we think in our life, oh my God, we'd be shaking. But they're squibs. He's been shown them already, you know, and they say, okay, Tommy, you'll be walking down here. There's one there, there's one there, be careful, there's one here. So you're ready for it. They say in the Wild West, and mentioned this at the one o'clock talk, that there were very few gunfights in reality of the kind of romanticized kind. That, uh, and when they were, often the, uh, uh, two fellows missed each other most of the time. And most of the fighting went on, you know, in alleys and dirty tricks and shooting people in the back, <clears throat> just as it does today. So uh, violence is only romanticized for the sake of story in, in fantasy environments. It's, it's not a good thing in real life. But it's good to have Unless you have a ray gun, because <laughs> there are none. What? It's good to have the story taking um, the series forward. Right. That is great. Yeah, because exactly. If you're into reading, and, you know, things have got a lot more dimension to them. To see it on the screen is joy. Yeah, I think that's one of the keys to the uh, show's success. It's a gamble to do a, an, in effect, incredibly elongated mini-series, if you will, because you need a pickup every year to do the next 22 episodes in this long novelistic treatment of a storyline. But if so far so good, we've gotten the third year now, and then I'll come back and surprise you. Yes. <laughs> so and then you, you, how many watched the episode last week? 
All right, so there was a surprise there, right? That, although some people say, well, I suspected or all of that. But that's a page turner. You know, that's part of the fun of it. When people would try to get me, now they're trying to get me to tell them what will go on in the double and the two-parter. I know a little bit, but I don't know a lot. And that's what you know. No, no. <laughs> that's, that's like if I read a good book that I really love, if I read a good book that I really love, then I recommended it to you. We were at work together, you know. And you got around 100 pages into it. And I said, oh, page 100. Well, you'll find it 115. <laughs> you right, ready to throttle me. So it's best to keep the secrets so they're fun. Were you surprised when you show, saw me uh, pop up in uh, the second yeah. season? Yeah. That's, uh, that's the mystery of it. That's part of the fun of the show. And I think one of the reasons the character has mystery to it and seems to be so popular is that we're all a mystery to ourselves. And we're all on a journey. This is described in somewhat heroic, mythic terms. But it's one of the reasons that people identify so strongly with the character. That question mark. That question mark, which we all carry with us. But, in my opinion. OK, I think that's a time to wind it up. Thank all right. I'd like to thank you very much, Michael, for being here. You bet. <laughs>